All right, you may be seated here, and uh, we are going to take our Bible tonight and uh, share some thoughts with you. Perhaps uh, a verse that we would uh, start with may be the, uh, the verse in the book of Luke, in chapter 24. If you just want to turn there quickly to give us a, a little bit of a thought of what the biblical protocols for prayer. This uh, is the last uh, one in the little booklet that we've been using on our Wednesday nights. And the title of the lesson is Exuberance. Well, I know that that means joy, right? That it's, it's a lesson about joy. But you know what I'd like to talk to you about tonight? I'd like to talk to you about the root of joy. What is it that really is responsible for bringing joy to our hearts? And uh, so I want to take you to Luke chapter 24 as a background for some of the things that I want to say. And uh, perhaps, you know, rather than reading uh, these verses, let me just remind you what's taking place. In Luke 24, Jesus has risen from the dead. And of course, his disciples aren't convinced. He meets up with two believers who are walking from Jerusalem back to their home in, in the village of Emmaus. Approximately a seven mile walk. And on the way, Jesus meets up with him and, and he does not allow them to recognize him. And they speak together and he questions them and uh, they don't know who he is and he asks them, why are you so sad? And they say, well, you mean you're the only one in Jerusalem that hasn't heard the news, right? And they tell him about how the, the one whom they thought was the Messiah had been crucified and uh, and how that, um, you know, he had talked about rising from the dead and so forth and so on. And uh, Jesus, of course, walks with them. And then he tells them, he says, Ought not Christ or Messiah to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And listen to this. Luke says, and beginning at Moses, now Moses would be what books of the Bible? Genesis through Deuteronomy, the first five books of our Bible. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. In the Bible that we call our Old Testament, Jesus took these two disciples in their walk through the scriptures pointing out the things in, those, in that scripture that pertain to him. That must have been some teaching, right? That must have been some walk. Well, he stops by invitation, sits down at a meal with them, and in the midst of that meal, he breaks the bread and they he allows them to recognize who he is. And as soon as they recognize it's Jesus, the Messiah, and he's risen, he vanishes. He disappears. He leaves. And they're alone. And as they reflect upon their walk, listen what they say. I'm turning your attention to verse 32. And they said to one another, Did not our heart burn within us? while he talked with us by the way, and while he opened to us the scripture. In other words, while he was pointing out himself in the scriptures, our hearts burned within us. You know, when land is being cleared by the use of dynamite, just before that detonating button is pressed, someone hollers, fire in the hole, and boom, the explosion. John the baptizer he baptized people with water, and that symbolized repentance on the part of the people. And he predicted, John predicted, that when Jesus the Messiah would come, that he would baptize people with the Holy Spirit and with fire. 
And he meant that the Holy Spirit would purge people's hearts and would set their hearts on fire. Believers who have a lot of zeal for the Lord are sometimes said to be on fire for the Lord. You've heard that? When people are passionate about something, people will comment, you know, that person has real fire in their belly, right? Well, believers need fire in the heart. Believers need burning hearts. And I want to talk to you about that tonight after we pray. Heavenly Father, I do pray that you would put within my heart and each one of our hearts and those that are listening who know you as Savior, your fire. We need your fire in our heart tonight. I ask, Lord, that you would do this for your name's sake and accomplish your will through us. And we will thank you in advance for it. Now be our teacher and guide us into all truth, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So what produces fire in your heart? How do you get fire in your heart? Where does a burning heart originate? Well, if you look at what happened here in uh, Luke chapter 24, you'll discover that as these disciples are reflecting on the time that they spent with the resurrected Jesus who revealed himself to them through the scriptures, he put fire in their heart in that way. How do you get it? What's the derivation? What's the origin of a burning heart, of fire in your heart? It's Jesus revealed in the Word of God. It's Jesus being revealed to your heart through the Scripture. It is a person being revealed to you, to your person. It's the indwelling Holy Spirit speaking to your heart and revealing Jesus to you, a fresh revelation of the Messiah deep within your soul would put a fire in your heart. It will cause you to say, my heart is burning within me. And what we're talking about here is understanding a person who gives you a perspective that you haven't had. The revelation of Jesus will enable you to understand more about him and his purpose, and that explanation will result in a deep inner confidence and a strong hope. Your heart will burn. I want to make a distinction here. What does it feel like? to have fire in your heart. Well, first of all, fire in your heart is not mere emotionalism. It's not a result of some external stimulus that originates outside of a person and, and it disappears when that stimulus is removed. That's a purely sensory type. And that kind of emotionalism, you need to hype it up. It has to be uh, manipulated. It has to be artificially manufactured. That's the kind of stuff that uh, happens at a rock concert, for example. That's emotionalism. That's not what we're talking about when we talk about fire in the heart. But it is emotion. Because emotion is a God-given thing. And our emotions are meant to be used in our worship of the Lord. And so fire in your heart is an emotion, but it comes from within. It is God touches your spirit and it resonates deeply within you, and it moves your heart, and your heart is the place where your emotions reside. 
It's God's truth understood by you and believed by you that causes your heart to overflow because it's been touched by God at the deepest level. You know, the word enthusiasm is an interesting word. We talk about fans being enthusiastic about their team. Did you know that the word enthusiasm is actually a, a compound Greek word that literally means in God? In God. And so it refers to God inspiring you. Not in the same way, of course, that he inspired the writers of Scripture, but it's God at work in your heart. It's God stirring your emotions. And that's what enthusiasm means. And so we're talking about fire in the heart. We're talking about God, a divine work that God does. It's not humanly created. It's not self-created. It's a God work within you. Fire in your heart. It's God's passion put within you. He creates it supernaturally in your innermost being. Well, what does it look like? Let me close by talking about a description of it. How does a burning heart express itself? It expresses itself in passion. It expresses itself in fervency. And uh, it, uh, it gives a stark contrast between deadness and life. And it involves vision, sight, and it involves sound. It is visible and it is audible. And uh, one verse that brings this together, listen to it, Psalm 47.1. Oh, clap your hands, all ye people. Audible. Shout unto the Lord with the voice of triumph. Audible, but visible too. Clap the hands, sight and sound, right? Shout to the Lord. And so a description of what it means to have fire in your heart. It is first of all visible. Listen to these verses, and this, is, this comes from actually the book that we've been following, and uh, the visible part, uplifted hands in praise. In other words, no attempt to hide the fire in your heart. Unintimidated. Listen to these verses. This is, uh, first of all, Psalm 28-2. Hear the voice of my supplications when I cry unto thee, when I lift up my voice toward thy holy art, uh, uh, oracle. Lift up your hands in the sanctuary and bless the Lord. Lift up our heart and our hands unto God in the heavens. Ezra the Lord, Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen, lifting up their hands, and they bowed their head and worshipped. I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands. Every one of those verses talks about the lifting up of the hands as a means of praising God. And so... To have fire in your heart is described as a lifting up of the hands to God. Holy hands, uh, Paul says in 1 Timothy chapter 2. It is, again, it is uninhibited. It is people that, uh, that don't care what others think. They are moved by the Lord to raise their hands in worship of the Lord. I don't have a problem with that. If it's genuinely from the heart, this is what believers have been doing for generations and for thousands of years. It's a part of having fire in your heart. That's how it, uh, it looks like. That's how it's described in Scripture. But it's not only visible, it's audible. I want you to 
uh, also see that it's shouts of praise, actually. So it's, it's uh, uplifted hands in praise with no attempt to hide or uninhibited, but it's also shouts of praise with no attempt to squelch, unintimidated. You remember when Jesus was coming in to Jerusalem for the last time before he was crucified? He was riding on that, uh, that foal of a donkey, that donkey colt, and the people were just shouting, Praise God! Save now! Recognizing him as the Messiah. And you remember what happened? The Pharisees came to Jesus and they said, Stop the people from shouting that. Quiet them down. And Jesus didn't accommodate the Pharisees. He said, if I did that, the rocks would cry out. He would not uh, squelch it. Listen to these verses. Psalm 511. But let all that put their trust in thee rejoice. Let them shout for joy because thou defendest them. 30 to 11, be glad in the Lord and rejoice ye righteous and shout for joy all ye that are upright in heart. 35, 27, Psalm. Let them shout for joy and be glad and that favor my righteous cause. 136, 16, I will also clothe her priests with salvation and her saints shall shout aloud for joy. Isaiah 12, 6, Cry out and shout, thou inhabitant of Zion, for great is the Holy One of Israel in the midst of thee. I don't have a problem with people shouting out amen and praise the Lord and hallelujah. This is the result and this is what it looks like. This is a description of fire in your heart and I don't like it faked. And I think most people can figure out when it's faked. But when it's real, it's contagious. Fire is contagious. And so I think that there's something perhaps that is missing from our life. And it's the result of no fire in the heart. It's the result of lifelessness, spiritual lifelessness. And I'm not talking about... Uh, uh, Again, manufacturing things and just making things happen because of external stimuli. But I'm talking about real inward movement of God's Spirit in our heart in which we are visibly uninhibited and we are audibly unintimidated. Revelation chapter 2 and verse 4 talks about the, the, the church at Ephesus having lost their first love. You know, believers with a passion for God, with a life on fire for God, with fire in the heart, their life will look like that. Their life will sound like we've just read in the scripture. Their life will be focused on and full of Jesus. But a, a believer that has left their first love and their first love is and always will be Jesus. When they lose their focus on him, there won't be any fire, that's for sure. It's that love, it's that first love that is really responsible for fire in your heart. And so we need to keep our focus on the Lord as our first love. And that's simply a response to the fact that he has first loved us, right? We love him because he first loved us. If you've ever gone camping, and I did my share of it when I was a, a kid myself, but with five boys and large, we did our, our share of camping, let me tell you. If you, go, if you go camping, you've discovered the importance of a campfire. You know that you need a a fire to cook on, you need a fire to keep warm, and when it gets dark, it provides light as well. And you never want your fire to go out, especially at night. But if you take a burning coal off of that campfire and remove it from the pile of red-hot coals, 
it will very quickly lose its fire when it sits alone. Mm -hmm. And believers will experience the same thing. And that's why a church assembly is so vitally important. It provides accountability, it provides encouragement, and it provides uh, a discipleship uh, atmosphere which is a necessary part of fire in the heart. I'm telling you, as uh, wonderful as it is that we can live stream to people that cannot be here, there is no substitute for being here. It's, if you're not here, it's like you're uh, a coal taken off from the fire and set aside. Trust me, it is having an effect and will continue to. And if you've lost your fire, or perhaps you've never had a fire to begin with, I would simply say, come to Christ <laughs> or come back to him, whatever the need might be, and ask him to put a fire in your heart. Do you have one? Is your heart on fire tonight? Is there real fervency? Is there real passion? Or have you lost it? Something for you to consider. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, I do ask that you might use just the simple thoughts that we've shared tonight to really cause us to bring ourselves before you and have you search our heart. Lord, we know. We know whether the fire is there or if it's waning or flickered out. You know and you make us to know. I pray whatever the need might be, if there's people that have never had a fire in their heart, they've never been born again, they've never been saved by simple trust in the Lord Jesus and his wonderful work for them on that cross, may they come tonight to trust him alone as Savior. May those of us that do know you as Savior, may we not be satisfied with cold hearts. May we not be satisfied with just business as usual gatherings, but may we want that fire of the Holy Spirit. Lord Jesus, you said that you would baptize your people with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Fire that would purge and cleanse and would bring fervency and power and joy, and exuberance and blessing. We pray that for ourselves tonight. In Jesus' name, amen.